Well, hello everyone, and thank you for watching this video. My name is David Townsend. I'm a sales engineer, uh, but that aside, I am glad you're here watching this video. It's a fairly long video, about 15 to 20 minutes long, but the reason why you should watch this is because it is covering the basics of the OSPF or Open Shortest Path First protocol, the routing protocol. And why am I doing this? Before Christmas, woo Christmas, before Christmas, um, there was a poll which I'd done asking, you know, what do you, my followers, want to learn more about? Is it BGP? Is it OSPF? Is it ISIS or intermediate system to intermediate system? And the figures really spoke for itself. It was, please tell us more about OSPF. So during this video, I'm just going to be covering the basics, the initial understanding of what OSPF is, why it's here, and really from a high level, how does it work? So stay tuned, watch this video. I promise you that if you're into networking, this will be at least a good refresher, and maybe some new information for you. OK, everyone, so let's get started on the basic introduction to what OSPF is, where it's used, and generally uh, a high level overview of this routed protocol. So what is OSPF? Well, first, OSPF actually stands for Open Shortest Path first. What does that actually mean in English? When you have basically got OSPF routers within the same uh, same autonomous system within the same area, or even to some even to some extent external areas, they will basically calculate what is the best path by what is the lowest metric, the lowest cost to get to this network prefix, to get towards an end destination itself. And OSPF is extremely popular from a routing protocol perspective. And OSPF is extremely popular. There's other routing protocols out there such as uh, RIP, and that can include V2. There's uh, ISIS, Intermediate System to Intermediate System. Uh, there can also be IBGP for uh, Internal uh, Autonomous System Protocol routing. Uh, and even farther, some, some other vendors, they've also got proprietary based routing pro protocols such as EI, GRP, uh, if you're going from the Cisco world. But OSPF is extremely popular. Obviously, this isn't proprietary. This is a open standard. So you have multiple vendors putting in uh, their expertise, their knowledge, their, their, their know-how. It's making OSPF a actual working and fundamentally great uh, routing protocol. But it's used in a variety of different networks because it is an open standard. It's used in data centers, it's used in service providers, it's used in enterprise networks, and so much more. And the reason I believe that it is so popular and used as the underlay routing protocol for all these different types of networks is because it is incredibly scalable. And what do I mean by that? What I mean by that is we've got these different areas here. You know, we've got area zero, area zero, we've got area one, and over here we've got area two. Why have we broken it down into all these different areas? Well, OSPF works on different air areas. If all of this was one big gigantic network, one big area, forget about the area number, but one big area itself, you could have thousands if not more, hundreds of thousands of, depending on the size of the network, of routing of network prefixes being advertised, sent, updated, acknowledged, so on and so forth. And if that's a core router accepting and receiving and updating its routing table and something called the LSDB or link state database, then that's perfectly fine for that core router. It's going to uh, be able to keep up with all those uh, updates and acknowledgements and of course store those prefixes in its routing table. But if you're looking at a lower cost or cost effective, I should say, multi-layer switch, i.e. a switch that has routing capabilities such as OSPF, then that's not going to be as efficient. That's not going to be as capable of keeping up to date and keeping up to pace with all those updates and acknowledgements and even storing all of those hundreds of thousands, maybe less of routing prefixes that are actually being sent and received. So the idea of areas, area zero, area one and area two is we're actually segmenting as such the network as a whole into different partitions, into different parts of the network as a whole. 
And what we've got here is area zero. And this is absolutely important because this is known as the backbone. What does that mean? Every area, area one, area two, three, four, five, duh, 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 the list goes on and on up to a certain number, but trust me, it's a lot. Every area has to be connected to area zero. It acts as the backbone. So if you've got traffic that wants to go from area one all the way over to area two, it's got to transit. It's got to go through the backbone that is area zero. So if we've got another area over here, and just quickly we'll call, call it area three, this would have to be connected to the backbone itself, to area zero. What is not allowed in the OSPF standard is to have two non-backbone areas connected together. So if I draw over here another area, and let's keep it simple, if I draw over here area four, if I draw over here area four, then what is not allowed is to actually connect area four indirectly to area zero. What I mean by that is it's actually going to connect to area three and then from area three into area zero. That is not allowed. It creates a discontiguous network. Now, there are ways to get around it by creating something called a virtual link, which creates a virtual tunnel as such all the way from area four to area zero through area three, but it's not recommended. And it's certainly not something that you should be keeping up and running for an extremely long time. But let's carry on with the basics. So in area one or area zero or any area for that actual, actual reason, in any area, they are exchanging, these routers are exchanging what's called link state ad advertisements at a specific period of time on first neighbor uh, setup on the adjacency or when there's a network topology change, such as network going down, they're exchanging LSAs. And there's a number of different LSAs all the way from one to 11, but most of those aren't, aren't really used. Uh, well, some of them aren't used, I should say. So if we look, just concentrate on one and two, this is your router LSA. And this is your network LSA, just writing net there for brevity. So in every area of an OSPF network, these LSA specifically type one, type two, they are exchanged only within that specific area that itself. These will not be rooted outside of their own area. So you will never see the LSAs type one, type two for area one in area zero and completely vice versa. Now, what is also important for OSPF is every single router in the same area maintains an identical copy of this link state database. And that is absolutely important because when a router comes online, it starts sending uh, the different OSPF packets, you know, hello and database description and LSUs, LSAs, uh, so on and so forth. Then they have to learn, they have to understand, they have to know, okay, what other air routers are in my site in the same area as me, but also what is attached to them? What is their router ID? What interfaces are participating in OSPF? Who, what's and who, what network pre prefixes are they advertising into the OSPF itself? And so in the same area, you cannot have a broken LSDB. Every LSDB in the same area on every single router has to be identical. If they're not, so if one router is not advertising uh, a specific new network prefix, but another router does have that network prefix, then it actually breaks the LSDB and it can create routing loops. Now, what is the type one LSA? Well, we're actually gonna go into a bit more detail in a later video what this is, but basically it's a router saying, who am I? Who have I got connected to me? And what is the cost or the metric to these interfaces themselves? Don't forget OSPS, OSPF is open shortest path first. Every router will calculate based on the lowest metric, the overall metric, what is the best cost to get to that destination itself. And here, the LSA type one is really identifying initially, this is a cost to get to this interface, to this network prefix that is connected to myself, and this is who I am. In a net, the network is really, because this is a multi-access network here, i.e. you've got, it's not point to point, you've got multiple uh, routers here connected to, to, to one another, then you've got a multi-access broadcast network. And as such, these routers 
need to need to designate or something something called a DR and a BDR. Designated router and backup designated router. What is that? In a multi access network in a broadcast network, you will have one designated router where every router creates an adjacency to and it basically maintains yes the lsdb but it also advertises that lsdb down to all the non drs to the non bdrs they're called d dr others i other type of routers so basically those dr others those other types of routers don't have to create a full adjacency to each other they only have to create an adjacency to that dr and of course then you've got bdr backup destination router if the dr should fail but what we've got here is this interesting type of router called an ABR. And you can see over here there's an ABR as well. What is that? Area border router. This is just one router or a router that has an interface in area zero, but also in a non backbone area. And this ABR here and the ABR over here, VMX1 and VMX4 uh, respectively, they actually have two LSDB. So they have two link state databases, one for area one and one for area zero for VMX1. For VMX4, they have this router will have one LSDB for area two and one for area zero. But what this ABR is doing is it's taking all the network information that's here and it's summarizing it. It's, it's, it is detailed, but it's not as much detail as you would see in a type one, type two LSA. But it's really just summarizing. This is the network that's connected to me and it's advertising that into area zero. And this would then transit through area zero to it gets to this ABR here and then that will inject that LSA into area two. Now what is that LSA? That LSA is type three summary. As I just said, the ABR is summarizing the network prefixes which are contained in one area, summarizing it and advertising it into the non backbone area where it's transited through to another ABR and to another ABR and out it goes. So you can have LSA type threes coming into and out of the um, backbone network that is area zero itself. So we've got ABRs, we've also got internal routers or and backbone routers. Backbone routers obviously speak for itself. These are routers that are inside the backbone itself, area zero, and internal routers are that uh, which are in a non-backbone area. So if you look at VMX3 and VMX2 and VMX5 over here, these would be internal routers, a non-backbone router. But there's another type of router that is called ASBR, Autonomous System Order Router. Now, say, for example, just down here, you've got VMX3 here and it's connected to another router. Uh, but here we've got you know, static routing. Or ISIS, whatever it may be, it's an external network that falls outside of the OSPF domain, outside of the OSPF network. Now, what happens here is VMX3 becomes an autonomous system border router and he actually takes these network ever the networks actually are here it will take those network prefixes in and it will store those network prefixes in its lstb and it will actually advertise those uh network prefixes known as type fives out type fives out to all other uh routers that are inside the same area okay so these type five lsas as i was just saying are going to be advertised throughout the entire area. So these static routes, this ISIS, this EBGP, if it's an EBGP peering router, whatever it may be, are advertised. All those routes that are contained within this router here are actually routed inside this area. They will be injected into area one via this AS ASBR as type fives. And what is a type five LSA? That is an autonomous system LSBR external router okay or external lsa uh, so these type fives are advertised all throughout the same area now that's really important because again it keeps the 